night is the terms from song to song is from an amazing guy called George Dodds who runs the Anik Wildlife Group. And I think just in a little sentence it encapsulates exactly what we're trying to do. If you get the soil right, everything else comes along and eventually you end up with the bird song which you'll see in a little while. And it's what I call common sense farming. Common sense, I think we've just heard from a previous uh, talk, is something which is in rare. It's rare, isn't it? It's hard to find it. Um, it strikes me that if you wanted to know which, uh, which pipe to go to, you'd be able to test the pipe, but maybe I'm up to it. Um, anyway, so it's also it's about common sense farming. So it's not about wilding. It's about a combination of farming and, the, and wildlife. So hopefully we'll cover that off um, as we go along. So where are we? Um, well, we are nine miles um, to the west of Morpeth. Um, we've got Hexham about 20 miles um, on the other side. Uh, we've got Newcastle about 18 miles to the south. Um, and Rothbury's about 12 miles to the north. So it's kind of in the sort of uh, mid-range of Northumberland land, if you know what I mean. Um, we're about 430 acres. It's a mixture of pasture, woodland, um, wetland. And then we've got the River Wandsbeck going through the bottom, as you can see there. And we've also got an amazing thing, which is the old railway, which is the old Wanny line, um, which used to run from Morpeth up to Scotts Gap, and then it split and went up to Rothbury one way, and then it went the other way um, over towards Bellingham. Um, it didn't close because of beaching. It, it closed because it never made any money. But it was an incredible connection to the local community, so all the gossip went along it. Um, in, the, uh, in the war, or just after the war in the 50s, we used to have a train stop every Thursday to collect rabbits. Um, because people were running out of food, and that was a, a local source. We've also got a field called the Strawberry Field. And the reason it's called that is the train used to stop people to pick strawberries. Or blackberries, depending on the time of year. So you can imagine here at Morpeth, I'm sorry, the train is delayed because they're picking strawberries at Middleton. <laughs> which has got to be better than the leaves of the line, hasn't it? Let's be honest. So the railway line is an amazing thing, because um, it is, if you know anything about railway lines and how they're constructed, it's nutrient poor. So it's absolutely stuffed with the most amazing wildflowers and all the insects, etc. that go with that. So it's an incredible lung that we've got on the place. So a little bit of what it's about. As I say, it's about a balance of common sense farming. And I really got this from this guy, who's my grandfather, Monty Watts. And he farmed in Hampshire in the, between the 1930s and the 1960s. And he had a classic mixed farm, almost exactly the same size as my farm. Um, but what he seemed to intuitively understand was that there's the environment and there's the farm, and they're both the same thing. If you like, in my mind, and I think in his, the environment is a crop. It's not something over there that you separate. It's something that you actively farm and you look after it. So we are, 80% of our farm is still in food production. So that's in sheep, cattle, hay or silage. We're not wilding. We haven't taken the place and pushed all the animals to one side. It's not NEP. Um, I get NEP. I like NEP. Um, I've worked with NEP. That farm didn't work very well, so it was a very good idea to do what they did. Our farm is still a productive farm, but as I say, it's with nature in mind. So how have we done that? So in my mind, we integrate the wildlife with the farm and the farm animals around it. So the meadows, for example, which are herbal-rich lays. So 70% of our farm, when I took it over, perhaps I should rewind a bit here, in that when I started doing this in 2019 in COVID, uh, my recruitment business went completely splat. Um, I had seven big assignments on and the whole lot died. And I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do now? So I thought, I'm not going to do I'm going to get out on the farm. And then I was, uh, a friend said, come down to London and I'll cheer you up. And on the way back, I bought the book Wilding from, about net, uh, from, uh, the, from King's Cross Station. And I was reading on the train and I got to Newcastle Station. And I sat on a bench and I didn't leave that bench until I finished that book. It was quite a late night. Um, but what I realised was that there is a way of doing this, of incorporating it. And that's what we did with the, with, the, uh, with the meadows and the hedges and all that stuff. So it's to bring it into the farm, but also to make use of unproductive land. If there's no point in farming something or it doesn't work, don't farm it. In nature, will have it you know, straight back and it will work really well. Um, and make the environment a crop. So that I keep going on about the hedges, but the hedges are amazing. They are wildlife corridors. They are habitats, but they're also shelter for the stock on either side of where they, they might be. Um, and they are just, you know, an incredible part of the landscape. If you look at it, I look at it holistically, so it also makes the landscape complete. Um, and I have passions about hedges. One thing I can't stand is people who cut hedges. I don't know about you, it does my head in. Um, because uh, if you take hawthorn, for example, hawthorn only buries on the second year. So if you cut it every year, what do you get? 
you don't get any berries, do you? So that, that doesn't work. So if you left the hedges, um, you get the berries, you get the wildlife, you get the birds. The only reason hedges get cut is because of one word, and that's neatness. Um, I'm a farmer, we, we've got this terrible habit of looking over everybody else's fence, saying, oh, look what he's doing, look what he's doing, or what she's doing, or what they're doing. And actually, that's what it's all about. They don't like to be seen to be being untidy, because that means you're a rubbish farmer. So if you come around my farm, if you come to that conclusion, you might, because my hedges are very woolly and very hairy. But um, they're doing an amazing job. So why farm with wildlife front of mind? And it's pretty obvious, isn't it? But um, extinction. So I wrote an article, I wrote articles for the Northumbrian, and I wrote one about a field and, and the history and the people who might have been in that field. And it took me back a long time, 10,000 years, you know, back to Doggerland, when people were wandering across into Northumberland. Um, at that time, there were things like mammoth wandering around. Um, there were oryx, those enormous, wonderful cows were wandering around. Wolves, bears, beavers, all these things. Some of them are obviously coming back. Um, but all these things are, have disappeared from our landscape. Um, but it's the things that are more nuanced, if you like. It's things like blue tits and robins and blackbirds. Things that you see, but they're just not there in the numbers they used to be. Um, and why is that? Well, again, you guys are all going to know, but it's the loss of habitat that's happened. And I think a lot of that comes from World War II. So after the war, um, we needed food, like we need now. We needed food. And farmers were turned to to produce food. So I'm not pointing my finger at them in any way. They did a really good job. But it was kind of a perfect storm, because what then happened was all these amazing chemicals, machinery took off, and for the countryside, it just got obliterated in many ways, whether it's hedges coming out of woods or ponds being filled in. They, they were doing what they were meant to do. And now, actually, they're being, it's even harder now, because they're saying, on a turn for six months, become environmental farmers immediately. That's a pretty hard ask in, in today's farming environment. But that's what happened. And what I, happened, I think happened was, it was, a, it was a loss of knowledge. And the, the thing I always think about is that if I said to you, I haven't seen you uh, for two years, you go, no, 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 Charlie, it was five years ago, it was COVID, do you not remember? And COVID created this sort of fog of knowledge, and we lost each other for a little while, and now hopefully we're all back together again. And that's what happened in World War II. So that knowledge is still there, it's still under the surface, and I'm really pleased to say it's bubbling through, and that common sense farming is coming back. So what have we done? Um, we've dug 15 ponds. Um, we have planted over 11 kilometres of hedge, we planted 15,000 trees, um, we put in 32 woodland pasture cages, and to explain what that is, if you can imagine a 12 foot rail, sort of across here, and then another one, and another there to make a square, and then raise it off the ground, it makes a cage. And within that we put a canopy tree, which could be like an oak, or a beech, or a scots pine, and around that are scrubby trees, things like rowan, um, hawthorn, dog rose, etc. And that creates a microhabitat within a field. And with any one of our fields, there'll be at least three of those. And the idea of that is that wildlife can then hop, skip, and jump from one place to another. But it also means, going back to my thing of integrating the farming with the wildlife, that in, I don't know if you find you're driving through the countryside at Easter time and it's peeing with rain and you'll see lambs shivering in fields with no cover. Absolutely does my head in. And so one of the ideas was to create shelter for animals like that, 360 degrees all the way around. Um, which is much better for the wild, wildlife, the lambs, and also, you know, for the farmer's bottom line at the end of it. So anyway, that's what those are about. Um, we've also put in 150 acres of meadow, which is uh, species-rich grassland, um, and that's done amazing things. So there are things in there like clover and birds with trefoil. And what they do is they're nitrogen fixers. So these farms have been hammered for 20 years. They were hammered with no grass on them, no wildlife, no uh, stock on them. So things like that are putting that back in. Um, 60 acres, uh, sorry, 100 acres of wild flower mix. So that is, again, uh, mainly for obviously pollinators, um, but we can also make hay and silage out of that, and it's just the way, the way that we, we manage it. And then there's uh, 60 acres of wild bird mix, and then obviously this time of the year, particularly now, you can really see that that's just, there are birds all over it. It's absolutely incredible uh, for them. Um, but we've also done things for, for humans as well, if you like. So we've put in bird hides. Um, our bird hides are quite hilarious, actually. It's very hard to see any birds because it's so overgrown. <laughs> but um, have you guys got Merlin? So Merlin is a, an app you get on your phone, and it'll tell you any bird that's there. I, I, last year, it just changed my life. Um, I used to go on a walk that took me 45 minutes. It now takes me two hours. Drives my wife nuts because I'm meant to be picking up the children or doing something, waiting for the postman who's going to come between 
February and March or something when they normally come. Um, anyway, but th anyway, that bird hide, if you take your Merlin app along and you're all welcome to come, uh, it, it's just changed the whole thing. The soundscape is extraordinary. Uh, we put up owl boxes, kestrel boxes, and small bird boxes. So, uh, unfortunately, none of those birds can read. <laughs> I think Winnie the Pooh was better. I think when they spelled owl wall, it was better than owl. Anyway, but, um, so we have uh, jackdaws, we have squirrels, we have... Everybody uses our bird boxes. Um, you know, uh, you know. Um, so, but they've been, they've been fantastic, and we continue to put those up. So how's it all happened? Well, I mentioned George George earlier and Richard Popperton, and what I was really keen on, I understood, I don't know why, intuitively beginning, we needed the data from the very beginning. So we've collect, collected data from when we've done nothing, and every year we collect data in all sorts of different ways. So whether it's the kids coming, we do bio blitzes, whether it's guys from university or you guys, whatever. Any data that's there, if you come for a walk, I'll write down what we see, and it's all gathered, and it's all, a lot of it's fed into Eric, which you guys will know about. Um, volunteers have been outstanding, and uh, in COVID, uh, I said to people in the village, would you like to come and plant trees? And loads of them did, and one of the ladies who came is a professor of uh, contagious diseases. So she was able to explain why it was safe, so everybody was good. Um, kind of. Anyway, but um, so what happened was they came, and I'd never really worked with volunteers before. My background is in business, and I'm used to managing teams of people who are being paid money. Um, these guys had to pay them cake <laughs> and, uh, and tea, and uh, they would turn up, you know, what, they're volunteers when they like. And uh, then they'd say, what do you think about this or that, and then we'd sit on the side of the field and talk about two hours about Trump or something like that, and then they'd go, oh, I've got to go now. <laughs> so um, that was fine, uh, but they were great, and the volunteers have done, I uh, joke apart, the outstanding work. Um, and the Northampton Rivers Trust, so they, you were talking about the Tyne Rivers Trust earlier, they're a similar sort of thing, and they do incredible things with rivers all over the, all over the county. And they came to me and they said, Charlie, do you want a pond? Oh, yeah, I don't really want a pond. Where's it coming from? A Coca-Cola. Oh, wow, all right. Uh, why? Why are they putting ponds in? Well, Coca-Cola have got a global policy to put more water back into the earth than they take out. That's a big thing. Coca-Cola is enormous, as you probably all know. And you can't just do that by turning the tap on. You have to do things. So they're doing wetlands all over Europe. They're doing wetlands in America. And they're doing ponds all over the UK. So they're actually physically doing something. They're not putting it into bio credits or anything. They're actually doing something. Um, and they've been an absolute joy to work with. So once we got the project set up, we, got it, we did all the work, we got all the quotes, boom, cheque was paid, and there's been no contract in terms of natural capital, biosphere upgrade. All they wanted to know was that it was there and that they could record it in, from a film point of view. And they've been amazing. So they've got a bottling plant in Morpeth. So these are all the guys from the bottling plant in Morpeth who came to plant trees. Um, so that's been quite interesting, hasn't it? Because I was quite cynical about greenwashing and things. And perhaps you could say there's a bit, but... I think it's about as good as it gets. The Woodland Trust have also been outstanding. I don't know if you know them. They kind of got an idea of the whole project, and they very quickly got behind us, uh, and they came along and gave us trees. And then literally yesterday, uh, or a couple of weeks ago, they'll say to me, Charlie, how many of the trees have died from last year? Because they just, they just do. Um, and, I, and it wasn't many, actually. Out of all those trees, I'm only putting in about 100 this year. But they, they supply them immediately. They're, they're outstanding, the Woodland Trust. Obviously, I've worked with the government of the Environment Agency in Natural England, uh, you'll get to know as we go through this, I'm very cynical of the government now, um, uh, for good reason. But uh, the people locally have been absolutely amazing. So Natural England and the Environment Agency have been, the people working in locally in Northumberland, incredible. Um, and then history. So uh, I, I found out that part of our farm is called the Hospital Plantation. I thought, that is a really weird name for a wood. Why is it called that? And the reason is because it used to be owned by the Greenwich Hospital. Greenwich Hospital in Northumberland. What? What is going on? And the reason is, it, that was, the Earl of Derwentwater was a Jack Jacobite. And he got the choice uh, of his head um, and lose all your lands or uh, keep your lands and change your religion. And he went for option A, or the blue pill as I call it. And uh, so he, he lost all that. And all that land went to the Crown, who then, um, who then gave it to the Greenwich Hospital to create income for wounded and injured sailors and their families, which at that time, there were obviously quite a lot. They were the most incredible improvers. So they then came across bits of land like ours, and they put in all the infrastructure and the buildings, etc. But when their cartographers weren't running around the world mapping the place, they were mapping all of their lands. Uh, and I found this map. I saw a little tiny reference on Google 
that the Lytton Phil in Newcastle, I hope you all know it's the best place in the world, uh, as far as I'm concerned, for research, etc., and does very good tea and coffee. But um, they, they, I said to them, do you have this, these maps? And they went, mm, yeah, I think we do. And they produced this map on a table like this, and there was our farm in 1805. And it showed me all the field names we'd lost, it showed me all the boundaries we'd lost. Um, so I'll give you an example. One of the fields is called Barron's Grave. And I thought, is that the way they buried a favourite pig? And it's not. A grave was a grove was a wood. So that tells me there was a wood there. So I don't know if you guys are into mycorrhizal fungi, or the wood wide web, as people call it, trees talking to each other. That tells me that, that might be a place where we could plant a wood again, because trees really want to grow where trees grew before. Another field was called Lime Pit Sheath. So that's where lime was dug. The field next door to it is called Winnie Close. And what we've worked out was they're digging out the lime and all the horrible old clay was going on the field next door, which then made it a bad place to, to grow anything. Right? Hence winds. Gorse tends to grow where it's bad. So all of that history has helped me now and put me to where we're now doing now. So we put those, those hedges back, we put all those names back. Um, and then I had to think, how am I going to visualise this? I see the world in a very visual way. And Thomas Buick was around at the time. You guys know all this because you've got loads of stuff in your archives and stuff. But he was actually doing a lot in Wallington, just literally in a hop, skip and a jump for us. So I recorded on Excel all the animals that he's recorded in the Northeast and then compared it with what we've got now. So I was able to see what we've got, what we've lost. And one of the things that was lost was cranes, for example. And literally two weeks after we did the records, a crane landed on the farm. <coughs> so it's been extraordinary that we've the history has played a, a massive part in what we're doing. Has it worked? My God, has it worked. It's off the scale, guys. Honestly, if, if, you, if you're depressed about the environment, come and see me for a day, because honestly, it's just bonkers what's going on. So we had a field that we did the winter bird can three years ago, and we found one yellow hammer and one snipe, and it, it just it just been sort of ploughed out wheat in it. And that year, we grew uh, the meadow on it, and for various reasons, we couldn't harvest it, and so it was long grass, about 50 acres of long grass. Long grass is a rare thing. Grass either gets mown or it gets grazed. Very rarely gets left to this height. So I have 50 acres of it, and surrounded by my woolly hedges I was telling you about, and George and I are walking along doing the winter bird camp, and Charlie, just, just shut up for you a minute, really. I, I, I talk a lot. Um, and, and he said, just be quiet for a minute. I said, why? He said, just, just look. And these yellow hammers were pouring out of the hedge into the field, literally pouring like a liquid, like a murmuration. And he went, hold on a minute. I said, how can you count this 300? He went, one, two, no. He, ca he gets a picture in his mind of what 10 looked like, what 100 looked like. 40 stone chests, 40 linens. We went around the bottom of the field, 40 stone So that was in two years that it happened. Um, and these are increasing all the time. All our numbers, I can share them with you, of all the winter birds are all increasing. Um, new species are arriving. I mentioned the, the, the crane, but they're also... It's not just birds. So last year we had four new species of dragonfly. Uh, we're finding newts, we're finding all sorts of invertebrates, other insects, um, scorpion-tailed hoverflies, all sorts of things. Um, and also, going back to what I mentioned originally, the existing species are increasing in number. The robins, the, the sparrows, the LBJs, the little brown drops, they're all increasing in number as well. And what, what we can't see, as I, I mentioned at the beginning, the soil. Uh, one thing I, the animals I love on this planet is moles. I think they're just brilliant. And... Um, Moles are doing incredible work because they are taking, and I talked about mycorrhizal fungi earlier, they, it's thought that their spores are carried, their tree spores from mycorrhizal fungi are carried by moles, moles, moles even. And they are, uh, they're aerating the soil, they're, they're causing uh, the water to be able to get away. But they're also eating tons and tons of worms. I think they eat their body weight, them, which is about a, tonics, a bar of tonics. Don't you eat tonics? Well, they eat one of them every day. Um, but they're also popping up all over my farm which tells me there are lots of worms. So I know good stuff is happening under the soil, and we're now getting into the science bit as well. So it is literally from soil to soil. Has it worked for the farming? Well, it really has. We produce the most, out I, I say this, but it is true, the most outstanding hay. And the reason I say that is because the guy I sold it to last year couldn't wait to get back and get some more. Uh, and the same with that, we made haylage, we made silage, um, and it's been difficult, I know, you know, uh, making it at certain times, I'll come on to that in a minute, but that has meant that we've got happy cows, happy sheep, and happy bees. And they are happy because that is multi-species uh, rich food, so they're, they're very happy. The bees, we've got um, bumblebees, the head of bumblebee conservation, we've got most of the bumblebees that you find in Northumberland now, on our farm. 
We've also got um, honeybees as well, which to me has been fascinating because the lady doesn't pay me any rent, she pays me in honey. And I get different coloured honey throughout the season. I never knew how it changed from they went from trees through to plants, um, through to things on the railway line, and the honey changes as the year goes on. Uh, and I, used, I don't know if it's coincidental, but I used to be slightly asthmatic. I now eat her honey every day and I don't have asthma anymore. So I don't know if that's true or not, but it's not all plain sailing. It really isn't. It really is difficult. Um, a, a farm is a, a factory with the roof open. And so to go back to that hay I mentioned earlier, I don't know if you guys, you, I'm sure you all know this, but the, the, the Gulf Stream this year, uh, uh, sorry, the, the jet stream moved um, south in the summer, just after we'd made the first lot of hay. And I didn't know that because I don't, I don't have a jet stream app. But uh, it had gone, and I knew it was raining, I knew that. And then it rained, and it rained, and it rained. We thought, oh, mate, hey, no, we can't, rain, no, we can't. And it was a total and utter nightmare. Uh, and eventually we made it, we got a little break in September, we made it, we were really lucky. But that's just a little example. And you will have seen this year, so the farmers, the poor farmers, farming is in a pretty hard state because, um, so for example, the, the red diesel they use has gone up hugely in price. The, the cost of the grain is very expensive. The people that put it in is very expensive. You get it on the, gr the ground this year, and then we had all that rain we've had recently. It's all been either washed out or it's germinated too early. It, it's really difficult with the weather. Um, government dithering is uh, unbelievable. I think it's a sport, isn't it? Um, they're, they're really good at it. Um, so when I started this, I thought they'll catch up. We'll have uh, elms will come along, and it's going to help us. Because we had a thing, us farmers, called the basic payment, which, thank you, you guys paid for it. But it kind of uh, underlined... Or, or, or kept farming going to a certain level that's hard enough. But the basic payment has been taken away in England now completely, but it hasn't been taken away in Scotland, Wales, or Northern Ireland, so we're in a totally unlevel playing field, and we're hoping the government's going to catch up, but it, it, it never has, um, so that's a bit of a bother. Um, lack of knowledge. So I, I came into this, I was running a recruitment business, as I said, I wasn't a farmer, I came in, and, uh, and I call it the Clarkson effect. Now, I know he's got a mixed press, and... You might not like him or whatever, but he's been very honest about what he did on his farm in Oxfordshire. And if you talk to any farmers that I know, they were really impressed by his honesty. It's not country farm. Country farm is sort of a sugared version of what goes on. That was reality. A 1,000 acre farm in Oxfordshire that made £140 profit. That's what that happened. So that is something that happened to me. I didn't have that knowledge, but I learned, I think as he did, I've made so many mistakes, uh, but I've learned from them all. Uh, and I now really embrace problems and mistakes when they come so actually it's been a really positive thing um, listening to advice I don't know <laughs> you've all had advice haven't you um, and uh, bad advice is very expensive isn't it um, and people would advise me so I was, I was planting like a, a nearly a mile of hedge and I said shall I put spirals on it and they're like no 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 it'll be fine the next day the whole thing had been eaten by hares they'd had a sort of hair hair banquet and uh, in fact, they don't eat them actually, they just sharpen their teeth. Sharpen. <laughs> and uh, so then, luckily, I then learned about this guy called Trico. So, have you got any tree problems? Trico is a substance that's made of uh, sheep's wool, it's a totally natural product. You put it on a tree or on a hedge plant, hares and deer will not go near it. It's absolutely brilliant. Anyway, so that's how I discovered that. Um, but I've had lots of advice which has just not been good. So, now I'm quite skeptical about advice. I will take it, but I'll listen a bit more carefully. So you could say um, scepticism from the farming industry. Oh, you're wilding, you're covering the la la la, you know, whatever. So I basically then invite people to come, farmers, other landowners to come. And, and, and I don't think I've ever seen anybody leave uh, without a sort of smile on their face and seeing something they can take away to their farm. So I've never had anybody who's really sort of shot me down completely. I don't think you could, to be honest. But, um, but it is, the farming industry, there is scepticism there, but they are willing to learn. They've got to make something of this. And generally speaking, they've been... Incredibly positive. Is it worth it? My God, is it worth it? The best thing out of all of this are these guys. Like these kids uh, mainly come out with a, a charity called the Country Trust, and they get kids together from uh, little, little primary schools, etc., from the really difficult places in our area. And they, these kids, for example, they might be five children that. Uh, with uh, different fathers, different mothers. You know, it's, it's unbelievable what some of them live with. But they're incredible. Um, like any children, they come out, we get them off the bus, they run around, they go completely nuts. And uh, one of the things I've learned from this is that children want to play. They, they very rarely get this opportunity to be out in the open, in the countryside, in greenery. 
And so we just let them out. They go nuts again, completely bonkers. And then we get them, and none of them have never got their hands dirty. So we immediately get digging worms. We start a worm charming. We get them doing that. Then we get them building dead hedges in the woods. In fact, we just leave them in the woods. Uh, some of them are still there. <laughs> uh, but no, they leave them in the woods. Because they start with they have very structured things. We'll do this, we'll do that. And I realise the teachers, hold on a minute. These kids just want to play. Just leave them. So they can be in there for two hours. Um, and then we'll drag things around. And then we'll go on tractors. And they are just um, wonderful. And uh, I hope with some of them I, show, I sow a little tiny seed. That's the worst thing about it, to be honest with you. I only ever see them once, and then the next year, the next year come. I'd like them to come all the time. But I've said that, kids, three to 103. You're all kids, aren't you? I still think of myself as a kid. I still like to play. I think we're all kids, so it's, it, it's brilliant. So farmers are getting it. As I said, they come, they visit, they like it, they, they listen to these talks. That's all good. Private companies are getting it, and they're so much easier to deal with. So the government, you get loads of red tape. So I did all this stuff for the government uh, to do these schemes, and then I got inspected by I think called the RPA, which is the Rural um, Payments Agency. I call them the Rural Policing Agency, or the right pain in the... Anyway. Um, so they then uh, come and inspect you, and they try and find things wrong with you. They don't come along and tell you what wonderful things you're doing, or can we encourage other farmers to come? No, they come and try and find something wrong with you, and then, uh, and then I have to get uh, basically my land agent to put together a case to defend myself for something I've done right, which they then agree I have, and then they go away, having cost me thousands of pounds. But private companies are not like that. They tend to come in, they know what they want to do, they pay the money, and then they're gone. So that is the future for me in the future, probably. I say the government is listening. I think they are. It's really difficult, isn't it? I think nowadays the environment agency, it's like a sort of poison challenge, isn't it? They seem to change every five minutes. Um, so anyway, I'm sorry, I, I shouldn't be cynical about that. Um, more landowners are engaging. So as this is going on, this is, when I started doing this, it was a very lonely furrow, and I didn't feel as if I was obviously the, the, the nutter on the bus. Um, but actually, as it's gone on, it's spread and it's spread and it's spread. So there's things called, I think there's a thing called um, Wild East, where in East Anglia, Anglia, can I say that? They, um, they're getting 20% of all the land uh, masses to be given back to nature. And the really lovely thing about that is it's not just farmers and landowners, it's people like, it's prisons and churches and schools. So it's, it's happening through all sorts of strata of landowners. Um, and we're still making food. I think, you know, right now, as we all know, in the world we're in that, it's really important that we do that. And I absolutely love it. I'm, I'm fired up by it, as you can hopefully tell. So what's next? Well, the really important thing is to diversify and spread this knowledge. So uh, whether it's I'm talking to you or I go uh, to, to schools or where I'm going, I'm just trying to diversify or get people onto the farm. Uh, we're trying to do that as much as I can. Uh, we are. And... The other thing I do is I go and visit people and I go and steal all their ideas and bring them back again. And hopefully I give them some love as well. So doing a lot of that. There's also a broader picture to what, the way I see it. So we've got quite a lot of art and photography that goes on. So we've got an artist uh, called Chris Partridge and we've got a photographer called Chris Woodcock. Um, <laughs> I call them the game birds. Um, they don't like that very much. But, um, uh, but they're... They're, they are really integral to where I see it because I think it's really important in the future. Do you know when um, you probably we can all probably do this? If, if you look at photograph albums, you can find albums of when you were a kid and what you're doing. We're all taking pictures on our phones. I'm worried that all this is just going to get lost and disappear because I've got stacks of laptops with photographs on them. I'm probably never going to look at again. So all these photographs are actually in a physical form, and the art is in a physical form. So I think it's just important for the future. I'm also getting involved with the new GCSE for natural history, which you guys might know about. So rather than it being a question and an exam, which it is now, you actually go out and get your hands dirty and get your hand lens out and go and look at stuff. Um, and that is coming along. And it, like, again, I was telling you earlier, it's, it, it, it's, it's got to the point the government has accepted it. They've now got to work their way through whether they're going to do it. I, I really hope they do. And I hope you guys can get behind it because that's super important. And I'd like to be at the centre of that and be a centre of excellence for it. Um, we're planting new woods uh, with Northumberland Forest and with uh, DEFRA, um, so there's going to be more habitats created over this year. Um, and I'm an open mind to new ideas, so I'm actually selling a bit of my farm so I can buy another one, um, with the idea of doing it with, with no government interference whatsoever. Um, so that's my idea for the future with that. Uh, we're doing these with mycorrhizal fungi, which I've explained, and there's one last thing on there, is my son has come up with this amazing idea of doing, uh, using compost on an agricultural basis. Uh, and matching up the right kinds of fungi for the right kind of crops and using um, waste, with waste wood from the wood industry to do that, uh, which then means we need to use less fertiliser, which is you know, brilliant, and we can improve soils. So all of that stuff is, is, is all happening. 
So, some questions. You might have one straight away. What am I doing there? Um, those are pants that we buried uh, for six months, and then my worms ate them. And that's what you left with. In fact, that's a year before the nowadays. This year's ones, there's literally just a strap, you know what I mean. Um, anyway, I always put them on because the kids think it's hilarious. But um, anyway, they are. So um, I hope that's been interesting. If you've got any questions, then please fire away. Thank you.